Hello and welcome to DV Test Podcast episode 7 now. Uh, today we have a very special episode. We have the integration special featuring Mr. Nathan, Mr. Heath Pants, Nick Rari, and Exiled, four of the best body workers in the Nerf hobby right now. I'm so excited to talk to all of them. Uh, so let's quickly go through and have everyone introduce themselves, talk about uh, who they are, what they do in the hobby, and uh, yeah, uh, so let's go, uh, Mr. Nathan, why don't you go first? All right, I'm Mr. Nathan. I focus mostly on integrations and other mild cosmetic uh, aspects of, of the hobby. Uh, a little bit into performance and things like that, but since I don't really have a organized uh, community out here, there's really no need to really push that, you know, uh, FPS thing or anything like that. And so it's more of just the fun aspect of things. Um, I actually started uh, like, or you, you ask, how'd you get here? Uh, I assume you're referring to how did I get involved with Nerf at all? Um, well, of course, growing up, we had a couple, you know, a couple Nerf guns growing up, but it, uh, this was back in like the old uh, mid nineties. And we, my brother and I played with them kind of the way you do as your kids. And my folks didn't want to buy new darts because the darts would get lost. And so they kind of got shoved in the toy box. And then it wasn't until uh, shortly after I was married, my, uh, in fact, I think I told the story a little bit in my why I nerf video. Um, but my wife growing up, she uh, grew up in a small town and was like the chief uh, best babysitter in the world, pretty much. And and so she had a lot of people, a lot of contacts that uh, followed her even after she was married. And she says, hey, can we watch these people's kids for a while? And I was like, okay, whatever. This is weird. Um, this is a, like a long weekend kind of thing. And I'm, I'm trying to figure out what, what the heck do we do with these kids for a while? And because my wife wanted them out of the kitchen so she could cook. And there's Nerf guns in the toy box. And I was like, whoa, Nerf guns. Yeah, I, 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 I remember this. It's it's different. You know, the darts are different and all that. And, and uh, this was... Uh, most of that stuff was in strike, you know, pre elite type stuff, but not knowing any better, you know, it was like, Hey, this is, there, there's potential here. And so when we got done with that and I was like, Hey, um, this nerf thing, it, it, it's kind of cool, you know? And so I started doing, doing research and finding out all about, um, not only the newer blasters coming out and the better performance, but also finding out that you can modify these things and coming from a hot rodding background, my, dad was a drag racer back in the 70s and we've always had that kind of you know stock is never good enough kind of vibe in our house and so i was like hey you know this is this is perfect you can take these things you can cut them up you can make them shoot harder and faster and all that and so it just just kind of a natural um you know, it just came naturally to me and so i bought one on craigslist and for five bucks i think i got a maverick and that was cool for a while and then i needed another one and and found out, man, you can get these things cheap, and it just kind of slowly builds. And then I learned about the integration thing, and that just took off from there. Very cool. Uh, Mr. Heathpants, why don't you go next? Okay. Um, well, I, I kind of got into it um, just a few few years back. I uh, was in college, um, just hanging out with my sister, and um, I think... I don't know. She had a friend. He he had a Titan, like the the full Titan system, and we play with that on occasion. Um, but then uh, didn't see him for a few years, and you know she was talking about it, and kind of just went to Kmart, and she was down the road from us, and picked up a couple. I got a long strike, and I don't. Know, I think she got a Vulcan. And so uh, I, I painted that long strike just straight black, and I think that was my first mod. So, um, and then I just I kind of got into it, started putting things together, you know, played some FPSs and things like that. So, just kind of started thinking about making replicas and stuff because it's like well you know what's cooler than a nerf gun is a nerf gun that looks like a real gun <laughs> but you know i even back then i think i was a little bit into airsoft passingly and paintball when we were younger and so not like in any serious way 
um, my grandparents had like a ranch on in Montana, and so uh, we brought our paintball guns there and airsoft and stuff. But uh, so I sort of just, you know, I I think I got a strife and I was gonna make like a a G thirty six or something from it, and then I put that down for like a year or more while I was in college, and then. I just kind of slowly started getting back into it and then I finished college and before our our first child was born, you know, I'm just kind of dinking around and making guns or whatever and blasters, excuse me. Um, and uh, then, you know, I just, for fun, just because it's cool or whatever, kind of like, you know, sculpture almost. And then, um, then I went to, like, I think, oh, how long ago is that? Two years ago, there's a war here in Utah in November. I just looked it up on Facebook. Are there any Nerf groups? You know, can we play with anybody? And then, uh, you know, so I went. And I think I've gone every single month since then. So, you know, two half years or something like that. And, you know, I ended up starting kind of, you know, helping run the group and getting us having uh, venue or events down closer to me in Utah Valley rather than Salt Lake Valley and having more advanced games and stuff like that. So, you know, um, and then continuing to push doing like uh, more and more complex visual and also uh, functional mods because I don't know, just the uh, making a stripe look like something just doesn't seem like quite enough when you you know can make the stripe do more or make a shotgun or whatever it is so uh, I think that kind of about sums it up for me alright and uh, we know plenty about Nick thanks to his earlier appearances on this podcast but if you want to uh, bring people back up to speed or for people who haven't heard before. Right. So just quickly in summary, uh, I've been in the hobby for a decade now. This is actually my 10th year. I started back when I got my first nerf blaster at eight years old. Um, it was actually a strike fire, that old dark tag blaster that came red and blue as a pack together. And my first mod was taking the red half and the blue half and putting them together. Uh, I thought that was the coolest thing ever. And then I got like a tech target and I put a stock on that. And my mods eventually escalated to doing things like uh, putting a uh, hyper fire uh, integrated into a single long shot. Uh, traditional hyper fire as we know today, but the dark tag one, which had a, basically a 10 round cylinder. Um, and kind of just progress from there. I do pretty much everything. Uh, homemade blasters integrations. Um, if you name it, I've probably done it except for HPA. So, uh, yeah. That's pretty much it for me. Awesome. What about you, Exiled? Yes. Okay. I'm actually from Singapore. I started modding in 2015. Um, so, compared to the rest of you guys, I think my modding career in Nerf is actually quite relatively young i see <laughs> so um i do mainly cosmetic shell integrations with all the internal upgrades and stuff um i don't really go to nerf wars because in singapore the life here is really really hectic and i have a family and work and stuff so um, modding is like my creative outlet to what i'm doing currently and um um just try to push uh, in terms of cosmetic integrations, the boundaries, you know, and um, try to make a blaster like what Heath and, and the rest have, have said, uh, make it look different, uh, make it look as good as it shoots and stuff like that. Oh, so, yeah, I still remember my first um, Nerf gun being, sorry, blaster. Uh, my, my first Nerf blaster being the rough gun. And the moment I got hold of it, I was I was still remember. Uh, I, I remember I was just playing with it in in the bathroom. So I was shooting at some of the the slope targets and stuff. And I was like thinking, hey, this is really quite quite powerful and stuff like that. Then I went online to go and search for 
for all the mod guides and stuff. So that was one of my first modifications, uh, uh, rough cut and stuff, and followed by uh, my rapid strike. The the integration started from there, and currently, um, yeah, that's 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 where I have been doing. For me, uh, very cool. And um, what what sort of uh, <coughs> inspires you guys to take um, ordinary Nerf blasters and toys and stuff and uh, turn them into you know, all these really unique and different things that you guys have? Um, we'll go in the same order to answer this. So, uh, Mr. Nathan, you can go first. Okay. Um, I guess mostly it just stems from you know not being content with things being stock. And so it's like, well, how do I make this thing look like less than what it is? And that, I guess, I guess there again stems from kind of my background with uh, hot rods and stuff like that. You can take something like uh, some of George Barris's early creations in the '50s. You take like the Hero had a Merc, and you you have to look really close to tell that, that thing used to be a Mercury. And but just the you know moving certain lines and and adding like with that you know a different uh, front end treatment, different grill insert, and stuff like that. You can do a, add a few small things and just move a few lines on the car and create something entirely different. And so doing the same thing with a Nerf gun, you could take and add, you know, like you take a, say, a rapid strike. And like I've done and others have done, you put a Raven on the back. You get something that's unique, you know, generally more comfortable or serves another purpose. Um, it's, I guess, t t taking what you have available to you and tailoring it to fit your needs, whether it's style-wise or comfort-wise or utility, you know, adding a, a master key or something like that, because you have, especially early in the in the flywheel days, we didn't have killer torque aftermarket motors. We had IMRs and RM2s and cool things like that. And so you had to, say, you know, uh, say put a rough cut on the front because that way, you, that way you have something that has a better rate of fire while you, you know, since you don't have the... Uh, immediate fire ability, you know, having to wait for the flywheels to spool up. And so I guess taking something and either uh, adding something or subtracting something in order to make it more efficient or, or more utilitarian to your needs, depending on your play style, or, you know, this thing's got like a flat top and a rapid strike. You say, why does it have a carry handle? I don't want the carry handle. You know, you chop it off, put a flat top on there. That increases the looks, doesn't really affect the utility as much, depending on what you're doing. And so, like I said, it's it's mostly uh, what what drives me, I guess, is take removing the things you don't like and adding the things you do like to create something that you like all the way around. What about you, Heath? Um, for me, I um I kind of just you know, so I really liked principle like paintball and airsoft when i was like i don't know I was like 14 or 15 maybe even younger when we were getting into that definitely too young to understand how to how to be serious about it and looking at it now it's like that would have been far too expensive and time consuming to have really been able to get into so this is almost like and what i want from the hobby frankly is like an alternative to things like airsoft and paintball and also like first person shooters like video games like this is like it's fun because you're you're out you're active you're really playing you're really doing it so what i'm after i guess is you know something approaching like paintball but safer more environmentally friendly as in you're not going to damage your walls if you play in your house you're not going to break any windows you're not going to you know I don't know, that kind of thing, and so and, you know, reusable ammo, so it's like you can keep playing. I like that it's like painless airsoft, and I think that that's really cool and so in some ways, you know, there's always like that I want to say like a, a guiding like a milsim factor in my work, in that I keep making replicas sort of like you would get from an airsoft gun. You know, you go out and you buy an M4 or whatever it is, or an AK-47. Not that I've made either of those, but um, 
you know, but instead of, you know, shooting pellets or whatever, it shoots, you know, darts. And then there's like the, the challenge of like making a Nerf gun that's a toy for kids and making it, you know, like a hobby grade, you know, like, I don't know, like sporting tool almost. And then making it look completely unlike what it started as is always, you know, it's a challenge. It's fun. You know, um, the latest one I've been working on, you know, making the strife symmetric is an awful challenge, but it's, you know, that's part of it is that there's always a new, new thing to do, new thing to make something that doesn't exist before. I mean, that's, I guess, kind of the other driving factor. I want to make things that don't exist, you know, that are truly unique. No one else has done, you know, like, it's like there aren't other pump action shotguns that eject shells. I mean, there's some others that have been started or work differently, but, you know, like making something one of a kind and then having that function where it's like, not only is it one of a kind, it also performs well that you can, you know, take it to a war and play, which I've done with, like, if it's not war practical, I don't really have an interest in making it. So um, that, that kind of is, I don't know, just where I go from is war practical, cosmetically interesting, and sometimes functionally unique. Very cool. Um, what about you, Nick? So, for as long as I can remember, I've I've always been making things, and so there's always been that drive for me to, you know, take something apart, make it better, customize it. Um, and coupled with that is like my uh, <laughs> uh, my 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 drive for perfection, as well as cr- constantly creating something original that has been able to like always have a fire and a passion for nerf over the past decade. And I've never like burnt out because there's always something new or something different I can try and achieve. And that's something that I can't really say about anything else. I've had hobbies that have come and go gone gone over the time of the past decade, but nerf has been something that has just stuck with me because it acts as that creative outlet for me that I can like infinitely draw from and be inspired by uh, what I, what I do sometimes is I'll just, I'll sit down and I'll, I'll think, and you know, I, granted I, I probably do this too much because I have way too many unfinished projects, but I'll just sit down with a pile of uh, Nerf blasters and I'll be like, Oh, I, I like that part. And, oh, I, I like, I like that part right there. What would it look like if, if those two go together? And ultimately, I, I could be like base, basing it off of some previous inspiration from others' work, but uh, ultimately, I, I try and make something that's original and uh, that the community hasn't seen before. Like when I made my uh, plus bow, for example, I know this isn't really an integration, but it's still applicable in the sense that everybody's made a plus bow, but nobody has made a plus bow that cosmetically looks like a crossbow. So I, I constantly try and push the bounds of what has been done before. And I feel like that really just keeps it fresh. Um, and in terms of like my actual aesthetic, I guess I could say that I, I really liked what uh, Mr. Nathan touched on where it's like, it's either adding or subtracting parts onto a blaster, really customizing the look in that sense where I find myself adding on different parts However, like when it comes to the actual shell, I find myself simplifying it uh, in in the sense of uh, removing details from the shell and making it a really clean, um, glossy look. If that makes any sense, like I will remove lines and you know the fake camo in the shell because I like the 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 more um, I don't I don't know how to describe it, but like clean look. So that's really where I draw my inspiration from and how I uh, end up working that into my aesthetic. And what about you, Exad? Yeah, <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> I think I have quite a similar background to Mr. Nathan. Before I was doing Nerf, I was actually playing or modifying uh, custom bikes. You know, those uh, Harleys with uh, ape hangers and all shit. 
So um, getting into NERF allows me to transfer uh, this portion of my skill set uh, into the, the NERF blasters itself. And I think the, the, the parts for NERF is so much cheaper than automotive parts and stuff. You know, I could, um, the, I, 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 I didn't even have to blink an eye buying like a few Nerf guns here and there and, and, and even the uh, ammo counter, cages and shit, you know, like uh, um, the, whatever they cost is like, oh, okay, yeah, can, sure, no problem. You know, uh, it's cost so much cheaper than, than playing with um, automotive stuff. And as for where I'm getting my inspirations, um, I, I, I think this is like a, a very common trait uh, among all of us over here, that we, we always want to create something that's uh, really different and um, original. So it's the strive to be, to be different from uh, the others, to not do um, whatever stuff that you have already, be, already been seeing on the net gives us this motivation to keep trying out new things. So usually where I get my inspirations from, I would uh, Google is the best platform for it. Um, I would go and search for specific keywords, uh, look for it, uh, look for look for certain blasters with the well, whatever basic lines I can get from there. And from there, I'll change it up a bit, adding in parts here and there. Um, try to get the lines that uh, what I envision it to be and just generally uh, progress from there. Uh, very cool. And uh, next question along the lines of uh, similar inspiration stuff. When you guys start a project, uh, how often do you guys start with like a vision for what you want the project to end up as versus like having a pile of parts and seeing how they go together? Um, how do you like plan out your builds? Uh, going in order again, Mr. Nathan first. Uh, it kind of depends. I mean, oftentimes, um, you know, you buy blasters or whatever. You ha you happen to have two on the on the bench at the same time, and you say, "Hey, you know, I wonder, uh, I wonder what this would look like with this stuck to it." Or, um, just in the course of you know handling blasters, you, you see certain lines, and you say, "Oh, I like that. I like that line, but but I don't like the functionality of the blaster at all." And so, things like like. Um, on the Jackal, I, I integrated the long shot front gun area onto the Strife itself, not just the barrel, um, you know, att attachment, putting the barrel attachment on the Strife, but integrating those lines and everything onto the blaster itself. That was just kind of a, uh, I, I just happened to, I mean, it, nobody really pays attention to the long shot front gun because it's basically worthless. And so I just happened to glance at it when I was thinking the right thing or something and saw it and thought, huh, you know, I wonder what that would look like if that was just molded right in and so i made a few cuts and started you know moving it around a little bit and thought hey that's that's really doable but you can't just put that on a, on a blank strife because that's you know that's lame and you know what's something that because uh, the, the lines of the long shot front gun will only go back so far so you need something that'll pick up those lines midway through the blaster and carry it the rest of the way so what's something i can integrate onto the strife in order to draw those lines back further and that's where i got the idea of you know, doing a Straven, but I thought, you know, what's the sense of doing a Straven in this in this day and age of the hobby? You can't do a Straven the same way the Stravens have been done for years. And so that's when I came up with the idea of not only uh, eliminating the Strife battery door and wrapping the Raven over both sides, but also cutting off the Strife handle entirely and integrating the Raven handle on there uh, to create something, you know, basically entirely unseen before something that'll uh i i guess uh sorry i'm dealing with the dog over here stop it um something that's uh i guess the, the jackal came as a uh you know started off with the strife integrated onto the, the long shot front gun thing and it just kind of escalates it was basically a culmination of several different ideas you know the straven thing off on its own was kind of an idea i had and the integrating long shot front gun thing was kind of a, an idea. And so I just happened to combine those all together. And then it just kind of rolls together that um, looking at it, I thought, you know, that the, the carry handle is too small for, for the dimensions and everything of the rest of the blasters. So I lopped that off and, and it just kind of 
projects kind of develop sometimes, like I said, with that one, it started off with one line. And as you apply that line, that influences the rest of the, the rest of the shell and the rest of the lines on that shell. And so you have to, you know, add something else or to pull something else off in order to carry that same idea through the rest of the project. Um, sometimes, sometimes I'll, uh, like, uh, Exiled and Heathpants and I have, uh, we chat quite often and we'll throw ideas around and, uh, Exile's always pulling out these pictures of some kind of, you know, sci-fi props and stuff like that. And there's been several times he throws up a picture and says, Hey, what do you guys think of that? And it's like, Oh dang, that's cool. You could build that out of a, out of one of these and cut one of these and put it up on the back. And, and then you can drag this part forward and, and, you know, and, and so, so some ideas come from uh, inspiration. You see a picture or, you know, even if it's not like a, trying to replicate that picture, you see like a certain line on there. That's like, Oh, Hey, that's, I like that. That line. I mean, I'm not a, I'm not a gamer. I don't like sci-fi. I don't, I'm, I'm not in that mindset all the time. And so, um, often I'll, I'll draw off of inspiration, especially from stuff he posts. Um, I draw a lot of inspiration from stuff other people, other people post, you know, some ideas all, whether it's an integration or just a, a cosmetic thing, um, you know, I'll see and say, Hey, I, I like that, that line or this, this idea, this general idea and be able to, you know, not replicate that, but just kind of pull that uh, something similar to that in there. And it's, it's kind of weird. It's, it's hard to really, um, I guess, articulate exactly what the brain does with this sort of thing. And so I, I can only, I can only hope that everybody else in here has the same kind of thing in their brain and they're going, Oh yeah, that makes sense. And they're not thinking, okay, I wish this guy would shut up because this isn't making sense. So, um, but no, it's, uh, it really depends. Some some stuff is drawn from inspiration of pictures or just images or or just certain lines, and other stuff is just you happen to you know get your box of blasters out and you have two sit next to each other and you go, oh hey, that's an idea. Some stuff's just totally kind of by chance like that. It just kind of something just kind of speaks to you. A certain certain something just kind of grabs you. Um. Well, I. I'm all over the place because sometimes it's like I'll see something and be like, "Oh, that'd be cool," and uh, or I'm just like talking to to these guys here and you know, or I see something they're doing and I'm like, "Ah!" Oh. But uh, more often than not, I'm usually looking to create something specific. I, you know, I majored in illustration and have a bachelor of fine arts, and so I do a lot of drawing. I mean, um, I like I stay home with our daughter and um, draw a web comic, so I'm drawing all the time and uh on my phone i'll you know just pull up like a picture of a strife or something and i'll draw the lines over it of say like a replica like a what i've been working on right now uh, an acr um like that assault rifle and um building a strife would be like the fourth time i've done it i almost do this yearly so um but uh so, you know, taking that and saying, well, how far can I take this? And so this time I've cut off the, I cut off the battery tray and, or yeah, the battery cover entirely. So the handguard is covering it. And uh, I managed to fit some fangs in there. That was, that's exciting. But uh, so, you know, then I, you know, I, I put a jam door, sliding jam door that locked into position on a, this one that I did for my friend, Mike. And, uh, you know, and so, you know, you hit it down and it, retracts and closes the jam door because it's got the top rail on it so you can't lift the jam door on the strife and then i was like well i want that feature because it's cool mostly and so I sit there and i'm like well but can i can i make it even better you know can i make this an even more accurate replica so i worked out fabricated you know janky you know catch so now it's got a bolt release on the handle you know like the real gun so the list of features just keeps growing that replicate the real thing you know and um and then you know adding a new handle because i didn't like this i don't like the strife handle so i wanted something more more unique more ergonomic and that's almost always one of the driving forces and then you know well has this been done you know has anyone you know i've always thought the hammer shot would be really cool if it's break action you know as soon as it came out i was like oh that'd be awesome you know break it open, rear load it. And no one did it. I was actually kind of surprised that I was the first person to think of doing that or not think of it, but to do it. 
And so I just, you know, finally, after a couple of years of having that idea, I was like, I'm just going to do it. And so, you know, just looked up what it, the drop cylinder mod and started getting to work. And I've, you know, third version of my pump action shotgun now because just saw a, something that I wanted to exist and, you know, saw a means to make it happen. And so, you know, spent a few months working on that, you know, for the, uh, I did, I did the first shotgun, first pump action for the Reddit shotgun contest. And I won that <laughs> as you, you might expect for the shell ejecting shotgun, but it wasn't good enough. It was, it was not enough. I wanted it to be better. I wanted it to function better. So, you know, I made a uh, Sentinel one and then I made, you know, for lever action. And then I made a, the third version using the Exus and got in more. I, I want to say it's like features, but it wasn't. It was like just like more of the mechanical accuracy to the real steel shotguns. You know, it's got the shell stops and, you know, so it's cycling, indexing a single shell into the chamber and it lifts on the forward movement and all of those sorts of things that, you know, as I'm looking into, you know, how the real version of it works and how they've engineered that. You know, I'm reverse engineering it to work with sledge fire shells, and you know, and I'm still, still tweaking and refining that. Uh, like just the other day, I tried a new bolt design, didn't work great, but I figured out how to make the shells eject a little better, and you know, and and things like that. So, so I I kind of like always have a goal in mind. I have like I want to replicate something. I want to make something new. I want to have this unique function you know i want to have a jam door that works like this or i want to uh you know i want to meet these criteria visually like it can't we it has to be you know like it has to be this narrow it has to be this this shape this size or you know it has to have this function is almost always what is like what gets me started on a project i actually rarely do you know what what nathan does where you know i'll look at something and say oh that'd be cool together because i don't um i mean this is mostly like an integration podcast but i tend to do more like just complete fabrication and scratch building is more my approach and so um i I, as, as I get better and better at that too, I use less and less Nerf parts. I threw away like a huge bucket of, of just scraps, like tiny scraps, you know, inch big or whatever, uh, like a couple of days ago because we don't have that much space for it. So, um, and I think that that's kind of about it for me. Like, I want, I want things that, that are, Real, like I want the Nerf version of a real steel, like airsoft. You know, like I said, it's, it's always kind of coming back to like what what airsoft wasn't for me, and making it that with Nerf. You know, having you know a group that can play and it can get competitive and intense, but it's still fun because it's still you know there's lower stakes and people aren't getting too serious and you know. And so when you want that, you know, you want your your nerf sniper you want your nerf shotgun you want your assault rifle or whatever it is so and i guess i just always have an idea and try as hard as i can to execute it accurately and what about you nick do you start with a uh, vision or do you kind of just throw things together so <clears throat> um I find myself only really getting into a... Okay, so I have to get excited about a project. Now, the way I do that is I start brainstorming for ideas. Uh, similar to Mr. Nathan, what I do, I will rummage around and you know try and think of inspiration like, uh, what could go well together? Uh, okay, th those lines kind of blend. Oh, but what about that? And so just that process, uh, you really start, the more and more you do, the more you can see things work together in your head. And I only really commit to a project uh, 
when I get really excited about it. And I only get excited about it if I find it something original or unique. Sure, there could be components of it that uh, drew inspiration from uh, 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 more common designs. However, if there are like interesting or new aspects to it that haven't really been done before, uh, that that's what I need to get excited about a project. And I guess uh, getting excited about a project, that can be a blessing and a curse. Because if uh, I lose that excitement for a project uh, because something went wrong, that could derail the whole entire project for me. So uh, I might have a vision for a blaster. Like, for example, I had a vision for a uh, Kenner Strife where instead of traditionally you would wrap the crossbow around the strife, you would instead try and shave down the strife to fit inside of the the crossbow. And I ran with that idea, and I, I as soon as I, I started planning it out, I would I got the parts for it and everything, and uh, ultimately that didn't pan out. And uh, I, I may have had that vision for uh, the crossbow strife, but it turned into now uh, my second revision my raptor strife and that was something that i completely wouldn't be able to predict uh, at the mi- over the middle of the summer but that's just how the pro- project that i was attempting progressed so i i might have a um idea for something uh but it re- my whole entire uh ethic and uh, my motivation for it really rides on how excited i am about the project so wherever that decides to take me is usually how I end up uh, going with the project. And last but not least, Exiled. Yeah. Um, okay, when it comes to vision or, or do I just smash the shells together, I would say I would belong more to the shell smashing part. <laughs> but um, <clears throat> actually, I do start off with a vision, but it comes, uh, in a sense, it's like an end product, but it's a really, really, really very fuzzy and, and, and vague look. Like, for example, um, uh, if I just pick on one of my projects to, to talk about it, um, um, say the uh, Nemesis hand cannon, uh, I just wanted to have uh, a Nemesis being made into a pistol, but uh, I've seen some um, looks, some, some other mods people did that just have the uh, trigger section that's right underneath the nemesis. So, to me, so um, from there on, I just start to add in parts here and there, lines and, and position things. Hot glue is your best friend, actually, when you're when you doing things like this. And I also have the same, uh, I think, uh, behavior with Nick uh, when it comes to certain projects being um, unable to meet the expectations halfway through. They become uh, and and they become actually parts for other projects. Even though I've spent a, a considerable amount of time working on it, say for example the the hand cannon again, I actually cannibalized part of my previous project for the grip, and it has worked out pretty well for the hand cannon so far. So um, if you're talking about um, uh, shell smashing part it would be more on uh, actually fitting in the little uh, parts and sections to to get the project gradually to the intended lines that I have in my head. I I can't, it's very unpredictable in a sense that I, I cannot draw out uh, on paper what is it that I want to do, but project, it always comes out uh, as intended because uh, Finally, that's what I, I I'm actually happy with. So, yeah, that's that's how I usually do my stuff. If I can interject here, uh, that's that's something that I can definitely relate to. Just uh, something that I recently had to, uh, something that I I think about myself. If I'm willing to put a hundred or two hundred hours into a blaster. For me, it is worthwhile restarting the project thirty minute, uh, sorry, thirty hours into it. If you if you are willing to put two hundred hours into something, you should also be willing to start over thirty hours in 
just because you know that if you're throwing all your your effort at something and you want something that is perfect, uh, that it is worth the time to to restart, whether that be cannibalizing a, a pro- part of a project and rebuilding into something else that you can actually love. I have to agree with that too, because uh, having uh, you know the art background or whatever, there are just times where something just isn't working, and instead of trying to save something that's broken or wrong or can't work, it's better to just get a new page out and draw again. So same with this, you know. And sometimes you just want to make something again because you want to do better, knowing that you can. Right. I also have to kind of echo what Exiled said on the uh, having a fuzzy image quite often of, of a project, you know, maybe seeing a few lines or something, but you never really know what exactly it's going to look like or how it's going to go. Um, w- watching his uh, Scourge project develop from some of the first, the first combination, some of the first uh, work in progress shots is an entirely different blaster from what he ended up with. And <laughs> It was just kind of funny to watch because I think the first the first ones he put together was uh, it was some kind of knockoff. Um, I don't don't even remember what it was, but he had them kind of laid out, and I remember looking at it, seeing on on Instagram, and thinking, "Okay, I'm I'm, I'm not quite seeing it. What 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 you have planned? But I'm I'm going to run with it. I mean, I'm, I'm sure you have a, have a vision." And then just watching as more and more parts got combined into it, and and you know some pieces got added, some pieces got taken away, and then you know seeing as it as it evolved into what it is and, and just being, you know, mouth agape at what, what has been wrought with that. It's just, it's just amazing seeing, you know, I guess, trusting, trusting him saying, okay, he, he saw something in his head and I may not recognize what it was at the beginning, but I'm all for what he ended up with. And so it's just kind of, it's kind of like when, uh, when I started the centaur, um, the minimized cent, uh, centurion strife deal, um, the owner basically said, I want to, I want to strike Turian. And I said, okay, well, I'm not going to do it like everybody else did. And he says, how are you going to do it? And I said, I don't know, but it's going to be cool. Just, just go with me on it. <laughs> and so I just started cutting and, and uh, went through a couple different uh, iterations and laid parts out a few different ways. And, and it's just, as the project progresses, it, it kind of, uh, the blaster tells you what it needs sometimes. And you just kind of go along with it and you just say, okay, well, this is, you know, you make a certain cut and it's like, oh, well, obviously I need to do this now. And, and sometimes things just totally make sense. And, and uh, so yeah, sometimes you, you don't really know what, what the end, the end picture is going to be, but you just kind of run with it. And uh, quite often you're very happy with what ends up or what you end up with. That, that commissioner must have a lot of faith if you're like, yeah, I don't, I don't really know how this is going to turn out, but uh, trust me on it. And then you come back to him like two hours later. Yeah, so this is uh, your Centurion. It's now a pile of uh, chopped up little pieces. I actually sent him that picture um, <laughs> when I when I took uh, when I went out to the shop and cut it into a billion pieces. I sent him the picture and said, "Okay, this is this is where faith comes in." And uh, <laughs> we kind of had that discussion, and he's like, "Hey, that's cool. You know, I'm I'm I don't I don't have any reason to doubt you yet." And I said, "Well, just just trust me because I'm 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 relying on faith myself right at this point." <laughs> I, but, I actually, excuse me. Uh, I, I actually uh, feel a little bit of anxiety sometimes whenever I uh, share my ideas for projects uh, on social media because more often than not, uh, anything that I share, idea wise, is not going to actually make it to the final product. Like it's not going to make <laughs> it to the final stage of done. So then you're going to get all these people asking, "What happened to that?" And I'm like, "Well." Uh, I- that didn't pan out. Uh, oh, and, I hate when that happens. <laughs> when uh, in more more recent uh, times, I had the the crossbow strike, for example, and uh, there's also a uh, a little bit of work I've been doing on a rapid strike on my Instagram, and uh, people are going to be uh, really confused when uh, I chopped off the entire frame for doing a bunch of uh, work to it. So. You know, I was actually wondering today. Um, I was working in the shop, and I was thinking, you know, I wonder, uh, you know, knowing that you're going to be on the on the podcast tonight, right? I was thinking, I wonder how that uh, that weird uh, double crossbow strife thing's going. Now I know <laughs> not to ask. Yeah, exactly. Because <laughs> like, 
more often than not, like anything that I, it's one of those things you, you cannot, you cannot be afraid to take risks when you're doing <laughs> inspiration. And if you want something original, you, you have to be willing to chop up two crossbows and be willing to fail. And you know, <laughs> I failed, but it's okay because ultimately I'm going to get something that I'm happy with. And you know, sometimes you got to let those things go. And it really helps the creative process. If you don't restrict yourself to the fear of, of cutting something up uh, and just yeah. having an understanding that uh, people are going to be judging you like, well, mm-hmm. well, what the hell happened to that? But like, you can't let that, you know, get in your head because you know, ultimately it, it's, it's about you for your, your projects. Well, and I love that post you made. I think you made it on Facebook and Instagram, both where you said something along the lines of this is the point of no return. Right. And it's like, yep, I, I, I know exactly what you're feeling right now. There's, been several times where you make the cut and you just kind of look at it for a minute and go, have I done something horrible? <laughs> and you, that, that's one of those things where, you know, like I said, you really have to have faith in yourself and say, okay, well, I've made a mess. I've made my bed. Now I need to, you know. <laughs> yeah, actually, I think you, people should, should constantly go to the point of no return so that you, you can push yourself to finish the project, actually. <laughs> Always. Please, please push yourself. Go to the point of no return, because if if you have fear on a project, you're just going to create something that's average. Well, and a failed project, yeah, yeah. And a failed project is is better than like having not tried. Right. Like, like you learn nothing from doing nothing. So, well, and so much experience, you get so much experience for making mistakes. And it it sounds cliche, and and you know, some kind of like a, you know, a cat poster kind of thing. But, but I've got a box full of bits of pieces of things that were a project and aren't a project anymore, but just knowing what I've learned from making those cuts and, you know, maybe it'll become something later on. I don't know, but, but just the, like my first integration was that, uh, what became the warlord. It was a rapid strike with a firefly stock and a, um, rough cut, uh, underbarreled, which is really a kind of conservative design at this point. But the first time I did it, it was, um, just really basic and it and i just wasn't happy with it and i ended up breaking it apart and making making it into what it is now and just just in the course of about a month of work just the difference between what i had to what i ended up with is just just i guess very very noticeable and just just looking at that and saying wow i I could have just gone with it with what i had and just said well it's okay but gaining that experience building the thing and then taking it all the way down to its, you know, elemental components and cutting a whole lot more out of it and reshaping a whole lot more things, just gaining that much more uh, experience on how the plastic moves and how the parts relate to each other and stuff is, you know, really invaluable. And so even if you end up with just a box of pieces, you have experience and you can, you can invest that experience into the next project. Exactly. Yes, and the pieces will always go to the next project as well. Yes. <laughs> yep. oh, I love scraps. <laughs> and I should have given you mine. Uh, I, I think I'm the only one here. It's like the scraps almost never help me. They just take up a lot of space because I just have gotten to the point. It's just, well, I can cut that with my utility knife, snap that out, glue it in. You know, if you ever don't, if you ever, uh, don't have a use for your scraps, if you end up going to Enor, uh, and you have a, a pile of, uh, crossbow parts, you can always chop them tiny little pieces and then hand them out to people as they come by booth. Uh, is that, uh, are you telling us what you're going to be doing at, uh, do I, do, can I, can I get a sweet autographed, uh, crossbow scrap? Don't tell Jack. <laughs> we'll, we'll let, me, uh, let me get a booth. <laughs> it's, it's a party favor. <laughs> get together with your friends and make a big crossbow puzzle. Oh. oh, oh god, 3D <laughs> puzzle. <laughs> Good times. All right, um, so moving on to the next topic. Um, I know some of you guys use a lot of 3D part, uh, 3D printed parts in your projects, others use, use less. Um, how do you feel about the like aftermarket that's like growing significantly right now uh, in 3D printed parts? Uh, and using them in integrations and blaster mods overall. 
uh, whoever wants to speak first on this topic, feel free to go ahead if anyone has strong feelings. Uh, so, I'm kind of... No, go ahead. No, no, you first. Oh, okay. Um, I'm kind of on the fence. Uh, most of my stuff, I guess... Uh, I don't know. For the most part, especially when 3D printed parts first really hit the market here, um, none of them were really matched the Nerf aesthetic. And so, as soon as you attach a 3D printed part, you you're adding some kind of foreign matter that doesn't look like it belongs. I mean, some of the first motor covers were just kind of a box, and it immediately said, "This is a box. This is a motor cover. This is I, I'm covering up a hole." And so I, I really had no use for them. But as as people become more creative and designing, you know, more nerf styled, I guess th things that are more designed to work with the shell, I'm becoming won over a little more. I don't know if I'll ever be a, a kit guy because I'm just I don't know. I just I just don't like I like the idea of the kits, and they're great for some for some people, but that's not how I express myself. I guess I can see. Uh, cer certain components. I mean, I'll, um, I'm being won over on some motor covers and stuff like that. But I guess even like the uh, like the Jace 3D stuff is beautiful, beautiful stuff. But it doesn't look like a Nerf component, and, and I like to maintain a, a a nice, consistent aesthetic on my builds. And so that's that to me. It it doesn't it doesn't really speak to me. Um, some of the stuff that uh, like Rehas has been putting out, uh, some of his recent stuff looks like Nerf styled i guess which sounds like a negative thing but if you're trying to match existing aesthetic then that's kind of what you're going for and that's that's why I've, I've been just building my own stuff up to this point because i can make it i can design or i guess i can cut up pieces of nerf stuff and add it to another nerf thing and make it all look like a nerf thing but now that uh, there's going to be more stuff on the market that matches the aesthetic enough then then i i'm you know becoming won over by it and you know, is it a, is it a benefit or a hindrance? Is your question? I no, no. It's not. It's not personally for me. I'm not going to be like I'm the new 3D printing guy. I'm going to buy all the 3D printed stuff. Um, but there is places for it. I mean, there's extended mag release. You know, I'm I'm cool with that. Um, you know, certain certain aspects of things, then I'm I'm totally cool with. I have no problems with, and I'll probably be uh, uh, integrating. Uh, integrating, um, using you know, using those in in future projects and stuff, and and uh, but I don't think I don't think it's going to be a replacement at all for for the traditional integration style. Um, there again, it, it's it's good for people to who have the same drive, I guess, as we do. We, we 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 integrate stuff. We build things from scratch. We you know build our own blasters to be unique. Some people don't necessarily have the tools or the um, wherewithal or the the you know quite the vision, I guess, to create something unique. And so there is a bit, uh, market out there for people who can purchase this product and have something unique. And especially since, you know, there's more than just the Vector Strife kit out there now. There's all kinds of stuff. And so you can buy, you know, retaliators. And I think I've seen stuff for the Hyperfire. And there's, you know, getting to be stuff for pretty much everything anymore and getting to be more and more as it goes on to where you can buy something and create a unique a unique, unique product for yourself, and so I do think it's good. And I'm anxious to see what uh, what the 3D printing market brings us in the future. Yeah, so, um, yeah, you go first, Nick. Okay, so um, <laughs> from people who've who have uh, been around for you know the time that I have, usually would have an expiration date where they go sour and go. Ah, like, oh, I hate all these these kit parts. They're ruining this hobby. This is awful. I hate it. What, why can't we go back to removing air restrictors and putting K26 <laughs> things? And uh, for me, I personally feel like if you aren't progressing with something, you are going to be left behind. You are, in progress, you are not going to progress. You are going to become sour, and you are going to uh, lose interest. And that carries over when it comes to 3D printed parts. Um, I feel like it it can't ever replace the art of integration. People like uh, Exiled and Mr. Nathan who have mastered that art, it, it can never replace that because that's truly unique. Um, however, there is definitely a place for it. people who don't necessarily have the ability just yet uh, to 
uh, do integration skills, but they want something custom, and that is perfect for them. Uh, I also feel like uh, I'm someone who has been able to use uh, both uh, existing kit parts as well as integration techniques and blend them together into something that is uh, aesthetically pleasing and it is not like overly sickening. <laughs> how many um, examples of that would be like I'm I'm a big fan of uh, when people print uh, heels to go on the bottom of their strife handles. I know Blaster Tech by far has the best uh, 3D printed heel that goes on the bottom of the strife handle. And if you, if you take that 3D printed part and you epoxy it on uh, as part of the strife handle and do some uh, putty work over that, it becomes part of the actual. Uh, a blaster, and that is a great use for 3D printed parts. I know, for example, that I use a 3D printed solid uh, heel um, on my biohazard build. I did a whole bunch of body work where I took 3 it's polycarb on one side, and uh, I, I completely built up half of the, the strife shell uh, just with, with putty and polycarbonate. However, I still was able to take a 3D printed part and make uh, use of it in a way that wasn't overly tacky or, or sickening. Um, and uh, in more m recent builds, the uh, the Raptor Stripe that I'm doing, I uh, I was noticing in the aesthetic when I integrated the stock into the Strife, it left this really big blocky back to it, and this kind of curvy Strife that was a little bit small in comparison. And something I talked with about uh, talk with with Mr. Nathan, um, but ultimately uh, I decided that there wasn't really a, a good blaster to integrate into the front that was really going to work well with the aesthetic. Uh, I figured the best aesthetic was to use a vector kit with the Madwell chopped off so it didn't look uh, so similar to one, and just having those those flat lines and those long uh, Picatinny rails uh, and, and the flat face front. Uh, really balanced out the aesthetic of the stock versus the front. So in applications like that, I feel like kit-based parts can be really useful in those niche applications, and a blending of the two uh, shouldn't necessarily be shunned, um, because that, that is something that is uh, more... It is still unique with the integration, and I feel like they can coexist together, um, but it, it can never replace integration itself as an art. I yeah. I think the kits are really cool. Like they're cool for people who want something that isn't just a nerf gun. But but I'm too cheap. I I've never bought one and I'm probably never going to because I would just sit there and I say, but I can make that myself. <laughs> you know, for way cheaper. You know, a sheet of ABS plastic is like what? But you know, I can make an entire kit from one sheet of plastic and a lot of time rather than spend you know 120 bucks or whatever that like the the gavin fuzzy's cqr one that is amazing that's so cool the only one i've ever thought hey, i'd get that 125 150 dollars i can't afford that <laughs> so <laughs> but you know for the people who who can and want to that's so awesome like it's awesome to have all the choices and and like like you were saying earlier you know integrating the printed parts into it i did my first like i mean i did my first printing for my shotgun because i couldn't make those parts you know like a bolt that has a hook on it for the extraction of the shells i can't i can do that but but i can model it in you know crappy sketchup and get something that is far far better and so as people keep developing things like a blaster forge his the things that he's doing are just crazy, you know. That, so many versions of. Sorry, what was that? This, no, I was just uh, agreeing with you. The stuff that Blaster Forge is doing is absolutely insane. Sorry, continue. I didn't mean to interrupt. I just there's a lot of awesome stuff happening, and I think 3D printing is, I mean, it's one of the ways that it's going to go in the future. So, you know, like. You know, what it, adapt or die.
I think Exiled had something to say. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, I would say 3D printed parts for me in general would remaining as parts of the project. Uh, I wouldn't really kit up a uh, blaster for... Uh, I wouldn't really use, like for example, the, the very common one, the Strife Vector Kit. Uh, I, I wouldn't use uh, that for my blasters. So, um, I mean, as a benefit or hindrance, I would say it is a benefit for um, newcomers, for new models. It, it drives up the interest uh, for a lot of people, I think, that you can you can actually create some kind of a real steel replica with with uh, these kits. But for for models, um, I would say try not to rely too much on on these kits itself. Uh, you can use it as a part to integrate into something else if you want to change it up a bit. Yeah, yeah, that's about it. So jumping off that, are there any uh, aftermarket companies that you particularly like or that you uh, buy from often? Uh, any ones that stand out to you? Mostly uh, the for me are motors. Yeah, like, basically. Make that saddle um, and home blast. Yeah, I think I've only ever bought, like as far as uh, really aftermarket stuff, the only thing I've really bought uh, some stuff from, yeah, basically just motors. I think I bought some stuff from Containment Crew, uh, Foam Blast. I think I bought some stuff from Blaster Tech a while back. Uh, but yeah, mo basically just motors and things like that because everything else I just cut off of something else. <laughs> Um, so I, I've probably dabbled experimenting with most of the aftermarket, uh, companies more than other people here, uh, just reading the room, uh, my, in terms of, um, uh, parts you can buy for part for, uh, building the aesthetic of your blaster and, and with, with the integration theme, I find myself being, um, Hawkeye or Black Steel Props best customer, uh, with how many uh, <laughs> flared Madwells and uh, clear motor covers I end up buying from him. It's, it's actually insane. Uh, but <laughs> for me, those just, the aesthetic of those and how low pro profile yet like smooth and like clean they look is, is just something I, I love and I keep throwing my money at supporting. Uh, especially now he has the, the rapid strike ones. Um, <clears throat> I, I'm, I'm a huge fan of those. I, I had to plug that. In terms of like motors and cages and whatnot, I find myself always uh, reaching for, uh, the best stuff that is on the market. Uh, however, that is constantly in flux and changing and really subjective. Uh, I am a huge advocate of DRS cages while not wildly available. Uh, I find them to just be the most accurate cages. Uh, motors... Uh, they're all relative, but I know that the Neo Hellcats are probably going to be the best motors if you don't need to go under a low FPS cap moving on in December, whenever they're released. I'm, I'm partial to the things because that size is so... I mean, I know there's going to be Neo Rhinos in their 130s, and... You know, I was going to hold out for those, but I had a pair of fangs and I could fit them. So uh, it's just such a, you know, like if you really believe in yourself and use like an open flywheel project cage, which I love those. Like I, I bought a riot cage, the riot wheels, the like the machining quality of those is, is really quite stellar. And so, but uh, I, I managed, I mean, you can fit with, you know, some squishing the fangs into a stock strife if you have the cage not recommended and yeah i yeah for for the one i'm working on and you know i did that i made sure that there was a lot of heat shrink in there so there's no contact but it's not the best practice but it's worth it <laughs> i i got to run that guy last night and uh, we we had a mini night war um, at a local arena. It's like A Marina A One M, and uh, the the owner Derek has been super nice. He's just letting us use it every now and then. And 
um, we had uh, five of us, and I ran that, and it's a pretty small arena, like maybe 40 feet on the long end, maybe 50. And it's just, oh, it's just great. Unloading on everyone with the, the riot cage in, in close quarters. <laughs> I just sat in the back and was, you know, they had to yeah. put their heads down. and That's uh, always fun. So, Speaking of, oh. uh, excuse me, go ahead, go ahead, try it. Oh, no, I didn't have anything to say, so... Okay, yeah, so, so speaking of uh, File Project, uh, if, if you are interested in the top-tier uh, FPS performance, uh, I am personally really excited about the Eclipse Cage uh, that is coming out soon. That in aluminum with the, like, 99% like uh, concavity going to be like absolutely insane like i know dense put out a review for like some prototype versions of it and having that like shoot numbers of like 180 on single stage is absolutely crazy so i'm i'm personally really excited for that uh in certain game types in my area although i know that's not open a lot of areas like yeah i'm i'm looking forward to that but I don't know if we'd we'd really allow it in our group so much, but I'm still look. It's really exciting. Yeah, a lot of the stuff is just so subjective at this point. Like you could have a 130 FPS blaster that competes with like a 160 FPS blaster. Uh, it's 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 all relative. So, mm-hmm. one of the things that I like about the open flywheel is because you have to use a softer tip dart, even though they're hitting much harder on velocity they just don't hurt you just feel it which i think is actually like as a a game runner when you have less like debate about who's tagging who and that just makes things run so much better so i'm an advocate of higher fps um in a in a you know relative sense you don't want anyone getting hurt but like if you get hit by like a waffle going 150 you know, you know you got hit, but you're not going to cry about it. Right, right. But if you get hit by an FDJ going, you know, 100, I know people who cry about it. So. There's, like, no reason to use a... Uh, I, I don't want to get into this uh, aspect of it because it is integration themed. Like, the note I want to end on for this is, like, I feel like in Nerf, like, there's no uh, reason to be using hard tip darts now with so many, like, cheap accurate versions, darts like AccuFakes being wildly I totally agree with that Yeah, there's there's so many better things on the market now Yeah Anyways uh, I don't know if Exile uh, chipped in yet oh, um, Actually, I just use mostly worker parts because the um, Singapore market is kind of slightly different. I think I have a friend that's a, that's a contact for a worker or something. So I usually get those small parts from him, like uh, barrels, um, rails, and stuff. Yeah. Oh, I love the third-party mags. The worker P mag is just the best. Oh, the P mag, yeah. And the max as well, yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, so moving on from companies making things specifically for our hobby, um, what tools, uh, glues, and other such uh, you know generic uh, items do you guys you prefer for your mods? What you, what brands do you guys use? What would you recommend to others? Uh, let's go in order for this one, uh, Mr. Nathan. You go first. Uh, well, I mean, for basic tools, it's nice to have a, um, and Dremels are nice, for, uh, you know, for certain applications, but I don't think they're really necessary. Um, I usually just use mine for removing like bulk material, but not really for final shaping or anything like that. And that's mostly because I could be impatient because I do get excited about projects and it's like, I want to get this material out of here so I can start shaping stuff. But a uh, basic, uh, handsaw uh like a and then the one i got uh was just bought at a, at a hobby store it's just i think 
a razor saw. You just get one with a nice kind of fine tip and or fine blade, and that'll do pretty good. Uh, my big file. I love my big file. Just a you know, just a big gnarly, not quite a rasp, but you know, a good uh, coarse file for removing material. Use the heck out of it if if you've seen my videos and uh, hobby knife like a number eleven exacto works real good for you know trimming things, deburring edges and stuff like that. Um, of course, you need like a what a number zero screwdriver or whatever that uh, obviously to get shells open and stuff. Uh, for adhesives and stuff, I am dead sold on DevCon DevCon plastic welder. I use that as much as possible and try to use anything else as little as possible. It's a, it's expensive, you know, per per unit, you know, compared to putty and stuff like that. But it's I would say it's the best thing on the market to do what we need to do what we need it to do to do because it's designed to do exactly that. It's designed to literally weld uh, plastic together instead of relying on a like a, a adhesive bond like you do with uh, epoxies and stuff like that. Uh, he's so I'd say. Oh, oh, sorry. I I think it's uh, getting a little bit of lag or something. So. Um. Uh, as far as like tools, my number one tool is absolutely just a utility knife with a sharp blade. Mm. You can score and break anything. I mean, I can cut through polycarbonate, ABS. It's all. I mean, I mean, almost everything I do is cut with <laughs> my utility knife. And then, you know, if I need a long straight edge, I just get my T square out and along that. And that's how I mean, like ma how I make all of the the custom body work that I do, all the fabricating is essentially just the utility in the knife. Um, and then uh, hot glue. I love hot glue, but I know that's uh, not the best. So I've, I've had some bad DevCon, so I'm trying that again. and Got a good batch, and that's really exciting. So, And then uh, epoxy sculpt is my favorite. So I think my, my two main tools are going to be my knife and the epoxy sculpt. And then other than that, just, you know, very things that you find and have every now and then. So. And uh, an odd one for me personally is, you know, I have a, a Galaxy Note so I can draw on my phone. And so I have an Autodesk, Autodesk sketchbook. And it's really good for jotting down ideas and, and checking things like drawing, seeing if the lines will work, the proportions and things like that for, like, my ideas. So. Um, and that one's a critical tool for me personally. Nick? So I have favorite tools for each step of the process. Um, for someone who has access to really fancy high-end tools like mills and lathes and drill presses and bandsaws and literally any tool that I could probably think of I have access to, um, I don't even really like using a Dremel. Uh, I, I try and avoid uh, using my Dremel and any sort of power tools uh, as much as I can. My favorite tool is by far uh, going like in line with uh, what Mr. Heath Pants is saying is I have a really sharp box cutter. And I use that for everything. Like when I need to cut a hole in a shell, just push it down into the shell and it cuts like butter. If I need to cut off part of a sheet of plastic, I can do that. If I need to smooth out uh, some uh, epoxy sculpt, I just run a utility uh, blade back and forth on it and it just peels it right up. And so that is by far my most useful tool. Obviously, you're going to need a screwdriver. Dremels are cute, I guess. I mean, they're good like taking <laughs> away material, but I find myself getting uh, really uh, uh, <laughs> trigger happy with those, so to speak, and uh, removing too much material than having to fill it in with putty. <laughs> So um, I, I like to uh, stick with uh, using a box cutter or utility blade as much as I can. And in terms of uh, adhesion and the integration process, uh, my process is to, once I have the, the, uh, the, the shells uh, cut with the lines that I want and fitting together well, I prep all the surfaces by sanding them. And then I hot glue tack them in place where I want them. Then I devcon around uh, all the uh, 
plastic on plastic contact areas. And then I uh, pour in five minute epoxy to basically resin, like infill all the gaps on the inside of the shell, which creates like a really strong bond. And then for the polishing process, uh, I recently switched over to epoxy sculpt, and I am never, ever, ever, ever turning back. That is probably one of the best materials I have ever found that has changed my life for up until this year i've been using epoxy putty which has like five minutes of time that is like so hard because you have like realistically only like a minute or two to work with the material and then it becomes hard but with epoxy sculpt you can make a huge batch of it and then put it on in lots of areas and then wet your hands with a cup of water on the side and smooth it out like clay which eliminates like 50 percent of the sanding it is just Having an hour of work time is like something that you you can't really appreciate until you you've been using epoxy sculpt for so long. Uh, sorry, excuse me, epoxy putty for so long, and then having uh, that much time to just really uh, plan out where you're going to be putting your putty and really making sure it's smoothed out. So those are my recommendations. Favorite tool, definitely a really sharp knife, and favorite like material probably epoxy sculpt but every material is is really necessary in each process of integration yeah for me actually i um find myself using a lot of the gardening snips and tin snips to to just you know just cut up the plastics uh, um, on the spot um I work in a in a very haphazard manner, so it's like when when the idea hits and then I see a certain part that I like, I just want to get it out as fast as I can. <laughs> a, a pair of snips, and I just cut all the way through. I don't care about the rest of the parts that I don't want, and yeah, that's usually how I do my my cutting. And uh, for for other parts that um, say, for example, I require a straight line, um, I would most likely use a Dremel um then probably file it down to to the proper um, dimensions and, and stuff but i uh, find it this dremels and all the power tools create so much noise that my wife is always nagging at me about it so using the using the snips are actually the quietest of the lot <laughs> sit down there in my corner and just cut things away yeah, and and as for um, epoxy product products, um, um, stuff like this, we I, I have a lack of all this uh, DEFCON um, plastic welders in Singapore. I cannot get my hands on any of the, of these things, so I have been using just um, also DEFCON, but those are epoxy putty, and um, um, a really old school way of um, epoxy putty on the outside. Uh, filling in uh, the, the the gaps inside with the DEFCON epoxy. Uh, if possible, I will do a mechanical joining of some sort, screws and here and there. I'm going to echo off that real quick. In terms of like the noise, like that's that's one of my biggest complaints with the Dremel. Like not only does it like create cancer clouds uh, whenever you use it, but uh, just the noise is really obnoxious, especially like when you're living in close quarters with the other people, like my current uh, living situation. Uh, and for me, like Nerf is something that is, it's therapeutic. It is a creative outlet at the end of the day. And if I can just like sit down in quiet and peace and just, you know, sand something or like uh, snip away at something like hours on end without having loud distracting noises, that's something that's I, I really appreciate. So, uh, not not using a Dremel is is really something that uh, people like like I and I guess Exile strive for because it's just it's so so nice. You, you can't like uh, overstate like just how how nice it is not having the noise of Dremel. <laughs> so like, the the keyword actually is end of the day. So it's actually at night when I usually do my modding and. <laughs> If I just go on and, and on the power tools, the whole neighborhood is going to wake up. Yep. <laughs> it's 
snips are also great. I really recommend those. I completely forgot. That was a great suggestion. Oh yeah, I've got uh, I've got that pair that I've been using. They're kind of a, a straight straight on cut that uh, I use a lot for clipping. I guess I need to add those on there too. Yes, the straight ones. Don't get the the curvy ones and stuff. You'll fuck up your plastic actually. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Everybody has that favorite pair of snips, or maybe maybe That's just actually have one. Weird. <laughs> Mine, uh, I think, uh, damaged them on something. I don't know, something metal or whatever. And so for me, I never got another pair. It's part of why I was so knife happy. <laughs> and I guess you do have to add, uh, I don't know if anybody ever specified hot glue, but hot glue is like, you really need it for, uh, for the integrating thing, just for test fitting and for, you know, getting, holding stuff in place. Why yeah, you get yeah. ready to uh, do epoxy right. in for the, it, for the final it has, it has its use. It's it's like as much as I like to hate on hot glue, like how for some material ever, it is really, really good for temporary things. It has its purpose. Oh yeah, and that's that's like really its only purpose, but I for for our for our usage and then it's it's really invaluable for what yeah. it is. It actually helps a lot with the visualization of the blaster. Definitely. Say for example if you want to something to, 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 if you want to just see how it looks like when it's being up, just use hot glue, use a lot of it. And then and you can actually hold up the blaster with, with the hot glue in place and stuff. So then you can get the ergonomic feel of, of things. Well, yeah, especially when you start fitting together six or eight different blaster pieces all together, it's hard to kind of hold it all up yeah. and yeah. hold it away from me and see what the profile looks like. So it's, it's nice to, to be able to stick them together real quick and be able to stand back and, you know, d- does this really look as good now that I'm, you know, s- standing away from it instead of having it right there in front of you and, you know, right on the bench? And... Yeah, I don't dare post it on social media, but I'm dealing with that right now. A whole bunch of random pieces hot glued together on my workbench, but that's not going <laughs> to stop by the day until I finish some other projects. Mm-hmm. So, speaking of favorites, uh, do you guys have your own personal favorite projects of uh, of your own that you've done and uh, your least favorite projects if you guys want to talk about that so going down the list Mr. Nathan first um, okay it's not really uh, a, a finished project to really look back on and, and say it was my favorite but I've I've been actually at a standstill for quite a while on the Centaur but I still think it's probably my favorite that I have in my hands right now just because of the uh, just the the journey that it's taken, kind of like we talked earlier, where I really wasn't sure what I was going to have. I just I kind of had a rough idea and just started running with it, and then just watching as as the build itself progressed and kind of evolved. It's just been nice to be able to. I guess I'm just I'm just very happy with how it's how it's been going. Um, but I suppose I've never really been unhappy with anything. I mean, even my Straven that I built you know years ago. I still look back and say, "Hey, that was that was good because it was it was different. It was unique at the time." And uh, but no, I think uh, I think favorite. I, I'd still say the centaurs top of my list still. Uh, Mr. Heath Pants. Um, that's kind of a hard one because, um, I mean, like it's always hard because it's like the latest thing, but. Um, I've liked uh, the ACR for some reason. Like the real gun, like looks really nice. I love the lines on it; it's so sleek and clean. But it's got just enough detail to be interesting. So I keep going back, building that over and over. Like like I said earlier, this is the fourth time. Um. Uh, but other than that, you know, for the obvious reason, you know, building that for myself as like just the primary that I'll just use every war. Um, I the the X2 shotgun the AG18 that I built. I love that. It's it's so fun to use. I mean, it sucks, kind of, because the range is you know 35 feet, kind of maybe 40. But there is something about when you know you get that perfect shell ejection, just flings out. There's a clank on the ground, and then you know you just push it forward to prime or chambers the shell perfectly and you know um at our war last night um i actually like wiped the entire team it was you know two on three 
but I got three in a row just with my shotgun, like one after another, and nothing can beat that. So, and you know, as a kind of backup favorite, the uh, the break action hammer shot that I did, I love that too. Um, it's I think that's one of my very favorites that I've done because it was so. I'm not a pistol, they're not really my thing, so doing one that I felt like was really satisfying and, and just feels good in the hand, feels good to use and to run is is really nice. If I'm going to do like a least favorite, I don't know, I, I think it's just like my first that I was posting anywhere, my uh, like a Magnus rifle. It's just, I, I've seen, I saw a picture of it the other day and it was like, oh, so ugly, oh my god. <laughs> What was I thinking? Sharing that with anybody. So. Nick, what about you? So this question's pretty easy for me. My favorite integration is always the one that I haven't done yet because uh, I haven't screwed it up yet. And my least favorite integration is every single integration that I've ever done because being a perfectionist, all I can see is flaws in the blaster I've built. If I were to hand you Biohazard, you would be like, oh, wow, this is amazing. Look at like all the body work you did, and wow. And I would sit there and be like, I could only see the flaws in it. I screwed up the paint there. There's a chip there. This part's uneven. <laughs> I could only see the flaws. So every single blaster that I've built, like even past integrations, is my least favorite. And it's, it's a bless and a curse. So never being satisfied with the blasters I've made makes it so like it's it's a curse because I can't ever love what I've made. But at the same time it is constant fuel and drive in this hobby to do which is something that is great because that means that I will always have a passion or a fire to constantly do better or remake or, or go for the next thing. So uh and exiled? Yeah, actually, I'm kind of the opposite from Nick. I'm like a little kid. The new one is always the favorite. And the least favorite ones are not completed. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so the the um, same thing with, with, I think, most of these guys as well. I can see the flaws of my stuff um, uh, from the pictures. They look good. But when I'm holding it, I'm just seeing, uh, yeah, actually, I use something to cover up uh, this fuck up here. Um, I use a sticker. I, I pasted something over here so that you don't see what's underneath. Um, but in in most cases, uh, it is always the the newest completed blaster that uh, it's sort of like you have the most mojo for it right now, and and you feel that it's the best looking one of the lot. But after a while, when the next project kicks in, uh, uh, that guy goes goes onto the shelf, and I forget about it. Like for example, even Scourge. Right now that I'm working on the hand cannons, the Scourge is actually tucked up in the shelf, and I, I, I don't even uh, look at it anymore. Yeah, so that's about it for me. I relate to that. Um, I, I wanted to add something. Damn, I'm forgetting now. Oh, well, I'll remember it later. Now, that was a good point, though, that you, that you brought up, and then Exiled also hit on, is that for whatever reason, our stuff photographs really well. And so you post a picture of something that you're pretty happy with, and people are like, oh my gosh, that thing looks so great. And you're like, yeah, you have no idea. It's, it's Thank like, you. you know. It, yeah, yeah, <laughs> Thank it's, you for starting my memory. Because but, if, if, sorry, if I cut you off, but no, if, you're you good. Ever, if you ever see a blaster in person, it is nowhere near as good as it looked in pictures. Everything has those like rose, like tinted uh, glasses look. When it, whenever you see something uh, online, it looks perfect to you because you are looking at it in the ideal light. But if you ever hold it in person, like I, I, I've held so many like quote unquote like famous blasters or uh, blasters that everybody knows at N. And you, you look at those in person, you're like, wow, these aren't <laughs> great at all. Like. There's so many flaws, and for someone who's like been such a big critic of my own work, uh, I, I I can point out or see those things in a lot of other people's work. Um, 
and it, it, it is never as good as it looks in pictures. And that is something to remind yourself whenever you're kicking yourself because the blaster isn't per- perfect, uh, to remember that it is never perfect. You know, everybody else has, has, um, has flawed blasters, even though it may not look like that. And uh, if you're a sane person like me, uh, that should be enough to, to be okay with your blaster. <laughs> Well, I think that's kind of the, the, the point I've gotten to, that uh, I mean, my stuff photographs well, and I don't use filters or anything. I just take a picture and go, oh, wow, I wish it looked that good and real. Um, but I know I, I actually went down to Utah. We were, my wife and I were down there for other reasons, but uh, Heath was nice enough to get some of the guys together, and we had kind of a quick war, and I packed the Hellhound down there, and uh, I got it out of my bag and put it on the table, and they're like, oh, my gosh, there it is. Can I touch it? And I'm like, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know. It just sits on my shelf. Otherwise, it's, it's. I guess to me, it's it's because I can see all of its flaws and stuff, and and things I could have done better. It doesn't really have quite the magic, and so I just kind of yeah, whatever. Just kind of tossed it over there, and oh, oh and it just it's just kind of fun to to see that. I yeah, guess to have the perspective of oh yeah, there it is. There, you know, whatever. And then you know, other people. Oh my gosh, there. It's it's that thing that I've seen online you know, has some kind of magical aura to it. And you're like, yeah, whatever. <laughs> yeah. On, I don't on, know. I, I held it. It was magical. <laughs> <laughs> on that note, though, like, um, like in, in terms of like whenever people, uh, my policy for letting people use my blasters is like, uh, I'm extremely open and I encourage people to ask to like borrow or like pick up or, you know, if they want to like pick up my blaster, like in war or something like that, like, I, I highly recommend people to do that. And they're, and sometimes I, I've gotten questions like, how can you be okay with like people like coming up and like and having like a hundred or so people at foam pond come up and, and pick up biohazard? Like, how can you not like have many panic attacks about that? And really, two things come into play. And one uh, is what uh, Miss, Mr. Nathan said about like how all you see is the flaws. So it's like, yes, whatever. It's not, it doesn't have as that spark, uh, to me as it is to you. Uh, and this my second policy is also, if you break it, it's my fault because that means I didn't build it well enough. If that makes sense. <laughs> so if you break it, you know, that is on me. Well, and also I guess being the builder, you know, that if something happens to it, you know how it went together, so you know what it takes to fix it, so it's not as big of a deal. To an extent, some things aren't fixable. <laughs> well, um, I mean, to a certain degree. I mean, <laughs> if someone puts a gash in my paint job, I'm like, well, <laughs> time to start over. <laughs> uh, so, continue on with some more questions. Uh, do you guys have anything on your personal wish list from Hasbro or any other of the uh, third, uh, any other of the like competing blaster companies, or things that you want to see, things that you would want to uh, use for integrations, that sort of thing? Uh, going down the line, starting with Mister Nathan first. Uh, I don't know. I mean, uh, the hard thing is, is you know that. By nature, we're gonna cut it up anyway. So asking Nerf to create like the best, the world's like most perfect product, we're just gonna cut it up anyway and use it on something else. And so yes, we exactly. might as well just just keep expecting them to build, you know, substandard stuff that we can use pieces of. <laughs> so I guess <laughs> as far as I guess that also goes along with the the evolution of the hobby, the evolution of the aesthetics, I guess too, because you know I I, I really like the in strike aesthetic, you know. The, a lot of the blasters are designed similarly, and so a lot of the lines jive together. Um, now that we're getting into kind of a different generation of of stuff, like trying to uh, like looking at the the new hyper, the newer Hyperfire, it's kind of boxy, and you know it has kind of the weird tiger stripey camo stuff in it, and so it doesn't really jump right into other shells. I mean, you could probably make it work, but it's not quite as natural as. You know, like like I said, the, the Rapid Strike Raven, the, the the characteristics of the shell are so similar that they blend together really, really well. That you don't actually need to try; you just kind of stick them together, and and the, the the angles and the the sharpness of the angles and just the the characteristics of the of the shell itself blend together so well. Um, we're just going to have to get 
more creative with what they give us, which is kind of exciting to a certain degree because, you know, as you watch new blasters get, get released and, you know, leaks and stuff like that, you look and you say, Oh, Hey, Hey, there's potential on that. Like when the, the AccuStrike stuff came out, I immediately saw the straw, the stock on the Alba Hawk and now on the rapid strike. And it's like, okay, that's uh, I, I can work with that. I think I can work with that. And so my brain starts working, you know, how, how am I going to implement these new lines onto some of these older blasters? And now that they're releasing more blasters in that line and all this stuff that's going to come out next year, how, how are those going to all fit together? And so I'm not necessarily like have a wish list of what they, I want them to build as long as the blasters don't suck. Uh, Mr. Heath Prince? Um, well, I mean, I, I do have a wish list. It's kind of stupid, but I mean, I'd love for a third party company to, you know, make a better version of like what I've done with the shotgun, you know, something that, you know, is more. You know, because that's one of the things about Nerf is that they can they can over engineer in a way that I can't because they have the means. You know, they have the means of production, so to speak. And so, you know, like when you you have something like the Atlas, and there's so many parts that move together and things like that. And you know, I've got like six parts do what it's supposed to. So, um, but and then just the only thing that I, I really thought was missing and I've never thought of a way to make it myself is like a, a Rebel Raven would be really cool. I think that that would be just awesome. Like the Rapid Red, but Bullpup, like a Raven. <laughs> and that's the end of my wish list. So, Moving on to Nick next. So uh, before I actually answer the question, I quickly want to like uh, uh add on to something that uh, Mr. Nathan said uh, in terms of like all the in-strike blasters having very similar aesthetics for someone who, uh, who spends so much time sanding blasters and doing body work on them. I take that time to like really notice the lines of the shell. And like, if you look at uh, three blasters uh, like the, the Raven, the strife and the rapid strike, especially the details around the grip you see the more and more you look at the blaster, you see all the similarities that they have together. Um, whether that be like a um, a line here or a line there, or the way that the, the 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 curves of the the trigger guard work, you know, whatever that might be, you start to notice more and more similarities together. So much so that I wanted to like almost like write a paper based on like <laughs> all, all the similarities of all the blasters from blaster to blaster. I, it, that, that has crossed my mind uh, with how much I've noticed uh, when I keep staring and staring at a blaster for so long. Uh, to actually answer the question, what are my wish lists? Wish lists? Uh, I've spoken on uh, other aftermarket stuff uh, in previous podcasts. So s- focusing primarily on Nerf, uh, I really, really, really enjoy it when Nerf releases more uh, sniper rifles, quote-unquote, quote and uh, thumbhole stocks. Um, the Hyperfire, was, to me, was something of a disappointment because it looked amazing. However, the handle was horribly uncomfortable. And I feel like the, the Raptor Strike kind of saved a little bit. However, still... I, I want more. Like, if there are more uh, sniper rifle esque blasters, I love uh, the thumbhole stock aesthetic and being able to incorporate that into more blasters in general. Just more stocks are always good. I personally don't really care if the blasters are shitty because if you can always integrate a strafe or a rapid strike into it, so it doesn't really matter if it's bad. I just want different cool aesthetics. <laughs> um, as bad as that might sound, uh, uh, because there's like so much of an aftermarket uh, build up around those two platforms, um, and my far out requests probably be a symmetrical strife. Uh, I feel like Nerf really <laughs> dropped the ball on that one. Uh, they uh, designed the strife; it is extremely one sided. Uh, something like I said when I when I sand it for like an hour, two hours, or thirty hours. Uh, I start to notice all the all the certain lines that don't carry over to the other side of the shell, and it pisses me off. For someone who who's a perfectionist, 
I see all those. I, oh, I, I see all of them, Hasbro. You can't hide them. You may like say like, oh, they won't notice. Those lines are similar enough. I can tell it's off by a degree. I can tell Hasbro. So uh, if they know, know it's good for them, uh, they should probably make a perfectly symmetrical strife. I'm not talking modulus. I'm not talking something weird. The same exact thing as a strife. Just like, you know, expand that one side out for me. Please and thank you. And exiled. I don't know how we can follow up that uh, that majestic rant. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, actually, I have uh, one single ren. Um, um, this one would not be so much on what I would expect Nerf to, to um, uh, or rather, what a wish list for Nerf would be, because um, you just just keep doing what uh, Hasbro, just keep doing what you do. We will build our own stuff. Uh, the only the only thing that pisses me off is, can you guys please stop building blasters that? that uh, don't have the same detail on the other side. You know, like, um, um, Strife is that, that one thing that Nick, that Nick touched on. The other one that I saw was the, what's the blaster with the huge chainsaw? The, the looks like a rough cut with a chainsaw attached to it, the zombie strike. Uh, that yeah, guy. Yeah. Um, oh my goodness, know. one one side is so has, has so much details. When I flipped it over to the other side, uh, it, it was totally different from, from, from the the one that's on the left. So just please stop making blasters that only have one-sided details. <laughs> Hasbro, I am I'm watching you. I'm watching you with eagle eyes. All these reviewers who looked at the modulus strife and like, yep, it's a reshell. No, that's wrong. If you look closely enough, they actually change the shell line in certain lines, like right above where the handle is on the left side of the shell. There's a different uh there's a different um, pattern that they chose they could fit on uh, more warning text. So you are very capable of changing the, the ejection mold. So, damn it, can you just fix that one issue and make it not one-sided? It is not that hard. You already remade the mold. You're not reusing it. Please, please, please save me and my sanity. <laughs> Maybe the catch is they, they know that you know and that they know that you're watching and now they're just screwing with you. Hey, Blaster Forge, if you're watching 3D, can you uh, just make a kit that'll fix that? I mean, I know personally that it will actually fix it for a couple reasons that I won't even point out because it'll drive you guys insane because you won't be able to look at a strike the same, uh, but it'll at least be close enough. Someone make an aftermarket uh, kit that uh, makes the strife more symmetrical, please. And thank you. How about an aftermarket strife that is symmetric? Because um, we've That's seen, crazy. you know, there's the prophecy and Exus, but where is the the ex strife or the strifacy? <laughs> Come on, guys. Let's let's let's. Make it so. So, based on our conversation that we just had, I think the answer to this is probably pretty obvious. Um, but which blaster do you guys use the most for your integrations? Or which <laughs> one do you like working with the most? Uh, going in order, Mr. Nathan can go oh. first. But I realize, as we've been discussing... <laughs> I've used a lot of strifes, but I've never actually built a strife that's still a strife. And I just basically take the strife's uh, failings and being asymmetrical and just cover it up. I was actually sitting at the bench a couple weeks ago looking and realized pretty much everything I've built is a strife inside, but you can't tell. It's a, it's a strife in disguise covering up all of its sins. And I guess because the strife is so compact, it's like as minimalist as you can get realistically on the flywheel platform, but yet still has all the good functionality. And so it's just a matter of taking, you know, I like all these cool shells, and then you just stick them to a strife. But I honestly don't like strifes that much as far as like aesthetically. I, I just don't like the strife line. I have to agree with that one. Uh, I don't. I've used the stripe quite a bit, and I, I kind of hate it. 
um, what I realized that I, you know, in making the fourth version of this gun, second stripe version, is I hate the handle. It took me probably a year of using it to recognize that the thing that drove me crazy about using it was that I don't like how it feels in my hand. And I switched it out for like a, an airsoft, it was like an M4, I think, airsoft handle, because it looked close enough. And the, the change to the ergonomics, getting rid of the strife handle, I will never, ever use a stock strife in a war ever again, like the handle, because it just feels so wrong. All they have to do is move it down a little bit, maybe narrow it out in some spots. Oh, they won't do it. Um, as far as like my favorite to work with, though, I think it, it's actually like I really liked working with the Exus and Sling Fires for whatever reason. They're kind of my like kind of some of my favorites. I don't know what much but you can't do that much with an Exus. You know, I I think I took it to the extreme with my shotgun, but I like it. So, you know. Um, I think, uh, my favorite, just because, uh, I like hurting myself like this, is I, I like using the strife, uh, just because I like finding creative ways of not making the lines bug me. Um, <laughs> however, I can, uh, disguise that as a, a nice challenge for me. Uh, and I also have to completely disagree uh, I love the strife handle. I find it's the most redeeming quality of the strife. That if I can cover up every single part of the strife except for the magwell and the handle, that'd be amazing. Because <laughs> internally, there's so many parts built up around it that it's just the perfect platform. But aesthetically, it's just a hot mess. <laughs> so uh, probably the strife, just because I hate myself like that. Actually, I find myself using quite a lot of rapid strikes, um, mainly the firing mechanisms and stuff. Uh, I do have quite a bit of mix uh, in terms of the kind of blasters I use for my integrations. But surprisingly, I have never built a strife. It's never, never a strife before. So uh, probably it's the, the asymmetry bothers me a lot. So that's why I, I don't even want to think of using it. And... Um, uh, yeah, generally, mostly uh, rapid strike parts. Rapid strikes are cool. I just can't stand there. They're so blocky. They're like squares. Yeah. Uh, it made a perfect perspective for me. And the symmetry was a big part of that. Like, to make a more accurate replica rather than the kit, which is... The kit's nice, but it's not really accurate, exactly. So, uh, I, I don't know the perfect place to ask this question, because it doesn't really fit into any questions, but I'm just genuinely curious. Uh, Mr. Heathpants, uh, when you do your your shell work, and you work primarily with plastic sheets, how do you mm -hmm. end up making the seam between the two shells? Like, How do you get it to split apart so perfectly so you have like a line down the center? Like, I, I, it's, that's crazy to me how you're able to do that. Um, well, that is probably the only place I actually do any integration, like um, on uh, my ACR. For the, for the shell to butterfly, I use, oh my gosh, I think it's a Zeus, the top rail from a Zeus, and I flipped it upside down so that I could still get the screw ports and the okay. butterflying. And I usually do that on the top and bottom where I can. Right. Um, I did a bullpup rapid strike. I think I used a, the rail from a chaos, just full full length of that um, mm -hmm. on the bottom, so that it'd have like something to grip and so that it could split open. And then uh, if I can't do that, I'll usually just cut the the plastic. I'll just get the ruler and just cut two equal sized strips or sheets or whatever it is, and just go to town gluing it and you know hold it. Hold it while, while the glue's curing. Usually, you know, at the hot glue stage, you know, you, you mm -hmm. tape it closed until it's cured. Or, you know, if you use Devcon or whatever it is, you know, you tape it closed so that it's as closed as possible so that the line is as slim as possible. Sometimes there's, like, little gaps and things, but... 
Okay, interesting. Uh, and one more question this would be for everybody. Just also genuinely curious. Uh, how do you die as a... Like, to what degree, like, is straight, like... To what, to what level of straight is straight enough for you when you're, like, lining your shells? Because I find, like, the tolerances of nerve shells being off a little bit bug the hell out of me because I can never get them perfectly straight. And I end up obsessing over that. Like, what, what degree of straight is good enough for you guys? Well, like you, like you said, the, uh, the tolerances of, of the nerve blasters themselves are kind of off. And so I guess I just kind of run with, you know, trying to get it as close as, as what I have to work with. Because you can't, you can't really make perfection out of something that's imperfect. And so I just kind of try to get as close as possible. But I do uh, actually have a, uh, a laser line that I got off of a cheap angle grinder, but it's some little attachment that shoots like a, a, a laser line. I have used that for aligning, uh, lining shells, just kind of, especially on the tack rails and stuff, lining that up and, and trying to get that aligned or even trying to find level on body lines down the side and stuff like that. But uh, un- unlike you, I try to find kind of a happy medium before I'm insane and just kind of say, that's good. That's going to be good. This will have to be good. <laughs> I, I go on the crazier side. I, I'm pretty sure. Um, you know, if, if you guys have ever watched uh, that YouTube show, Man at Arms, where they make the swords, and they hold the sword out, and they're looking at how straight it is, that's me for, you know, 10 hours of build. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm more with the pants on this. And then uh, what I usually do is um, if, if there's enough space, like, uh, like say, the top, and it needs to be flat, I will take the entire thing, put it upside down and on, like, a table that, at least to my visual knowledge, is straight, and then hold it there while, like, the glue is curing so that it will, you know, cure straight mm-hmm. when I can. Sometimes you can't fit the spot that you need to to do that, and that's always frustrating. And that's also how I check how straight it is. You know, if if you see any gaps when you put it, you know, on the the flat countertop or whatever against the wall, yeah. there's never straight enough, never too straight, I should say. I I, 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 I tend to agree with Mr. Heath Pants here. Like, I spend probably thirty hours trying to get my first uh, attempt of the raptor strife to be straight and uh my conclusion was uh the raptor strife stock itself isn't straight <laughs> which is like <laughs> breaks you down like as a person just like your everything is just dead inside when you like come to that realization at the end of those 30 hours so um <laughs> yeah if you ever want to have a good laugh, I don't, I don't know if uh, anybody watching is a fan of Rick and Morty, but just, just search Rick and Morty True Level on YouTube. It's like a one-minute video, and you'll understand how I feel about uh, level blasters and getting the level. It drives me insane. Yeah, My least favorite that. blaster. I saw the vid. I saw the vid. That, that's really insane. <laughs> yeah, that is how I react. It is... My least favorite part of the integration process is trying to get things straight because I'm a perfectionist yeah. and I'm never happy. That, that, that's a common problem for all of us, I guess, um, because we are always merging different shells and stuff. For me, uh, you really would just have to be contented with getting there like uh, 90% or something. Um, I just use the eyeball technique, you know, I just look at it and, uh, okay, it's straight. And, and, and I just convince myself it's straight. Um, on other parts that, for example, that uh, some some other integrations that I really fuck it up where where it becomes um, slanted, then uh, those won't get to the finishing line. I just toss it into bang to the bin again. <laughs> and uh, one last question for the viewers out there: um, Do you have any tips? Uh, for people who are just getting into integrating uh, and body work and that sort of thing uh, from the top, Mr. Nathan? Uh, well, kind of like we talked about uh, right there at the beginning. In fact, I think it was we were talking about it before we actually started to record. Don't be afraid to screw stuff up because 
you're going to, especially if you're just like just starting. Um, you're going to cut off too much material. You're going to cut something crooked. You're going to stick things together wrong. Uh, the best way to mitigate that, I guess, is to try to get blasters as cheap as possible. I mean, I I generally try to use uh, thrifted blasters. Stuff I was able to get uh, yard sales or ridiculous discounts of some kind. That way, if you do screw it up, your investment is still very minimal. But it also, you know, having having smaller initial investment also allows you to be a little daring with things. You know, to, to you know, kind of uh, make your own roads, so to speak, uh, because you're not quite so, you know, looking at wow, I spent fifty bucks on this. If I cut this wrong, I'm totally screwed. Do it again. You can say, ah, it was like five, eight bucks, whatever. You can, you know, be a little, a little edgier with things, but um, yeah, realize you're going to make mistakes, but you're going to learn from them, and that's the most important thing. Um, and I think once you get beyond that, you could really start to, I guess, utilize the other, um, you know, advice, which would be, you know, try to make things as good as possible. Um, when you're making a cut, don't cut on the line. Cut. You know, cut the line long a little bit and then trim up to fit. Um, test fit a lot, a lot. I mean, like even if you just clip a little a little piece or just you know file this little spot, test it again before you move on because you know the whole measure twice, cut once thing works. Because if you you know say this is exactly where I need to cut it or I need to make this thing fit exactly here, Something happens between when you take the measurement and when you actually make the cut. Some some weird thing happens to where the line moves. So never rely on that. Um, but yeah, just uh, I think I think uh, as far as you know, advice to first time integrators. You know, do a lot of research beforehand. Um, have a good idea of what you kind of want to have happen, or what your end goal is going to be. Um, but don't be afraid to do things different. If if you go out and you say, I'm going to make a Straven, all you've proven is that you can be like everybody else. It's like when uh, when I made my Straven, you know, I think it was my second integration before there's really the Straven stigma. I was like, hey, I'm going to make one of those because, I mean, I liked the look and it was like, it, it, I saw so many that were done and I've covered it in my, in my Straven video. But the one cut on the on the left hand side just honestly bugged the heck out of me. Of all the Stravens you always see online everywhere, that just bugged the heck out of me. And I was like, "There's got to be a reason why they're doing it this way." But I don't see what that reason is, so I'm going to do it my way. And was a lot happier with with the final product, having having stepped out of the comfort zone a little bit of of hey, everybody's doing it this way, but I'm going to do it this other way, and you know. I don't know, I guess I guess having the, the courage to do things differently um, than everybody else does it. I mean, there again, it's kind of cliche, but just because everybody else is doing it doesn't mean it's the best way to do it. It just happens to be the way everybody else is doing it. So I guess be, uh, I don't know, uh, don't be afraid to, to take chances on things. There again, because you're going to screw up anyway, so just get used to it. <laughs> Um, well, for me, this is coming from sort of a different perspective. You know, I do like illustration or whatever. And one of the things it was like one of my classes, we went over doing thumbnails. That was like what we ended up doing the entire class. I think it was called like visual literacy. And so we spent like three quarters of that class just drawing tiny drawings where all you care about is how it's composed. That applies to this. You know, the more time you spend in preparation, you know, planning, you know, maybe making some mock-ups, doing some drawings and things like that, the more time you'll save in the long run because you'll solve problems before you even start. You know, before you touch any plastic, before you start cutting anything, you can figure out, you know, like, that's how I made, like, my first ACR. I was looking at the handguard, and I was like, well, that's like a square with a trapezoid shape on it, and that's, and that's just a square down there, and then there's this round part, and so I started breaking it down into these shapes. And so if you look at something and you say, it looks like this, it looks like these shapes, especially for like, you know, the scratch building and, and fabricating like that, um, you, it's really actually a lot simpler than you'd think. It's just 
having the patience to analyze it and cut carefully and glue things together and you know look at the angles look at the shapes and and the lines and stuff and you know so i i'd say my advice is you know plan the heck out of it you know see see how far you can get before you actually start yeah so i think it's going to be echoed for everybody but it's just it, it can't be stated like too little like you need to not be afraid to screw up like <laughs> using the terminology that uh <laughs> that uh mr nathan used you can't be afraid to be edgy I'm probably the edge lord because I uh, cut up two crossbows for a build that is not to be completed. So, you know, you got you have to get to that level of uh of uh willing to just you know, you got to be willing to try whatever it takes to you know, create something original or, or something you're happy with. And just don't be afraid to cut something apart like Everybody might call you crazy, might be calling yourself crazy, might be crazy. But if if you're going to get something that's new, you're going to be with, you're going to be pushing those those boundaries. It, it is so worthwhile, and just to don't be afraid to make those cuts because even if you screw, up, if you're going to screw. Up, that is going to ultimately mean you're going to get better down the line. And if if I haven't screwed up. <laughs> I, I would not be where I am today because I have screwed up so many times and people are like sometimes in awe like some of the stuff that I was able to build like I got there through a path of screwing up like Nick your your plus bow is beautiful yeah well when I was 11 I tried to make a plus bow with a Dremel and it was a cancer fire like you gotta screw up gotta be willing to make mistakes and just try it just Try it. Yep. Um, whatever all the other three have said, and uh, to add that on, one of the most important things I think that um, any new models that, that want to try out uh, modifying is stop talking about wanting to do it and actually do it. And I see so many posts on people saying, that, oh, I, I intend to do this, to do this thing, or I intend to to integrate this and stuff, but they never actually got to do it. You know, just just put your thoughts into action and just go for it, you know? So yeah, that's about it. Okay, uh, well, if no one else has anything else to add, that wraps it up for me. Um, so quickly going down the list, uh, where can people find you and see your work, uh, Mr. Nathan? Um, you can find me on uh, YouTube, the uh, channel's name is uh, Mr. Nathan. Also on Facebook and Instagram under Mr. Nathan Mods. Um, uh, on Instagram and YouTube for under Mr. Heath Pants. Um, and I mean, you can feel free to add me on Facebook if you want. I only turn down things that look like spam. Uh, you can uh, find me on YouTube, Nick Rowe. However, if you want the most up-to-date stuff, um, that is probably going to be uh, my Instagram, also at Nick Rowe. Uh, I post up a lot of progress of my pictures up there, uh, of, of all the builds I'm doing, and sometimes on my YouTube channel I'm trying out uh, messing with live streams and see how that goes, but we'll see how that goes. Uh, I don't really have a lot of time to uh, commit to my YouTube channel right now in the semester, but definitely in my Instagram if you want to stay up to date. Uh, feel free to add me on Facebook. My, I'm Nick Marvin on there. If you ever want to ask a question, I don't bite. I'm happy to answer any question you might have. Uh, I have a lot of information that I've gathered over the years, so I'm happy to share that with you. I don't bite. Yep, and for me, it would be mostly on Instagram, Exile878. I do have a YouTube channel, but uh, that one is just for me to upload uh, videos and stuff. Uh, doesn't really, I don't really communicate much over at the channel. Uh, 
uh, I do more of my postings on Instagram. Yeah, that's about it. And of course, all of those links will be down below in the description of the video. Um, thank you guys all for coming here, and thank you everyone for listening. Um, like always, I have no idea what's going to happen next week, but stay tuned for something else exciting. Um, and uh, I think Mr. Nathan probably has the best like outro message of anyone on YouTube right now. So, Mr. Nathan, if you want to uh, do your thing. Okay, are we all done? Yeah, I believe so. All right, well, wishing blue skies and green lights to you and yours, and may all your be teeny-weeny ones. Go, go, go.